Stephen Walker. You'll, you'll hear me more after lunch. But it's my great pleasure to introduce Larry Reynolds. Larry was for a long time at my own university in, in Lancaster. He's now become a truly European intellectual um, with a period in Berlin and now here in Paris as a, as a resident here. I, I think he lives here uh, sort of <laughs> perpetually. Um, so over to you, Larry, 40 minutes. OK, thank you very much, Gordon. So this really begins the social science uh, part of the, uh, the, the workshop uh, or symposium. And, and hopefully the more empirical information coming from the social sciences can then come into dialogue with philosophy and policy around transitions. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, something called distributed energy and its potentials for democracy, uh, for democratizing the energy system. Um, oh, by the way, I'd like to thank uh, the IAS for hosting me here as a fellow and uh, EDF for generously funding this research. Um, so I want to start from the claims that uh, to have a successful and socially just energy transition, this must be under democratic control. It must be democratic and participatory. Just flip forward. Here's a fairly um, a good illustration of the, of the kind of discourse. This is from the European Union uh, Energy Union the, earlier this year. And you can see um, the most important part of their vision, they say, is an energy transition with citizen ownership, citizens taking ownership of the energy transition. Something about reducing their bills, interesting participating actively in the market. Uh, later in the presentation, explore the kind of different uh, um, registers of politics and the market in which uh, energy democratization are, are expressed. Um, Statements like the one from the uh, Energy Union can be found all over uh, the energy transition policy and social movement world about the need for a democratic to democratize the energy system. You know, and it's expressed in the register um, uh, that the existing corporate players don't have it in their interest to bring about an energy transition that somehow a not-for-profit, uh, socially controlled, democratically accountable energy system will be uh, easier uh, to transition to a, a, a low-carbon set of technologies. And, and so it identifies the existing economic structure of the energy system as a barrier to that transition. Um, so uh, there's a lot of... Uh, one expression that comes up in uh, the UK discourse a lot is from the big six uh, to the big 60 million. This idea that there'll be a plurality of actors replacing the corporate monopoly. Uh, plurality that includes uh, individual households with solar panels, co-ops, communities, new peer-to-peer -peer formations, municipalities, and new private businesses entering the electricity market. Um, uh, okay, so I want to uh, explore the different visions of energy democracy that might occur within distributed energy. Um, and I'm going to try and analyze uh, different uh, statements and manifestations of the energy democracy discourse along a, a series of parallel kind of axes or binaries, really. Um, so one register of analysis would be whether this is a form of a representative democracy or participatory democracy. Uh, another is the question of scale, hence the title Scales of Justice, in terms of what uh, uh, scale of governance of transition is appropriate and, 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 and is happening. So uh, between the national or local scale energy transition and energy projects. Uh, whether the participation of the public uh, is understood as being a, a collective participation with some kind of uh, deliberative democracy, uh, 
or individualized participation, the collective or the individual. Uh, another binary is whether this is uh, seen as manifest uh, energy democracy comes through uh, some sort of energy commons or an energy market. And finally, uh, whether people are interpolated into this new energy system in the mode of being citizens or being consumers. Now, these binaries, I kind of also want to emphasize when I get into the uh, detail that the, there's often blurred lines, those nice little slashes between the binaries. You know, often uh, a, a manifestation of uh, an energy democracy discourse can um, uh, be both, you know, a citizen and a consumer. Um, So, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of look at f uh, four kind of mega trends, really, um, that, are, that are happening. I'm just playing with the device here. That's it. Um, so, th the first is uh, distributed energy. And I'll explain what these are to those people unfamiliar with these terms uh, in the next few slides. So... The, the question of distributed energy, what is this? The, the idea uh, of an energy generation plant uh, being more small scale and distributed, whether this would lead to new distributions of ownership, political power and accountability. The, the distributed energy uh, is, is emerging at the same time as two other developments, uh, both more technical and economic developments, the first being smart grids, the um, convergence of information technology with the energy system, which uh, in some visions, uh, the smart grid will change the energy system as dramatically as the internet and mobile phones have changed communication. Uh, but all this also occurs within the context of market liberalization, uh, of a, a, a series of changes in the, in the structure of the energy market with new entrants, with uh, consumer choice. So this uh, energy democracy movement and the various manifestations of that energy democracy movement occur within this context of uh, three other uh, socio-technical economic changes, smart grids, distributed energy, and the liberalized market. Um, yes. So just to really sum up, you know, to give a, a brief overview of what, uh, what is distributed energy. The first characteristic that's re uh, remarkable is the, the, the new generation uh, energy generation technologies come at a smaller scale. Um, and this is, I mean, not just renewable energy, or, although it's specifically solar, onshore wind, uh, biogas, combined heat and power come at a smaller scale, but also conventional fossil fuel generation plant is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, the mid-20th century saw the size of uh, uh, power stations grow huge to over a gigawatt. Today, with a lot of uh, gas turbine power stations, these are also getting smaller. So distributed energy can also be a feature of conventional power, although it's particularly associated with renewable energy. The next feature is that uh, its deployment is more decentralized. Um, in terms of, so it doesn't have the same kind of uh, national grid. You know, the, the model we got from the mid 20th century onwards was huge power stations with a national energy infrastructure. This is more decentralized and it can be placed in closer proximity to the end users. You know, often people can have solar panels on their own rooftop. So this changes the spatial scale of the energy system but also the kinds of ownership and forms of social power that might emerge. So it can be owned by a variety of actors, ranging from individual householders to communities and co-ops to maybe whole cities and local governments, so again, suggesting a democratization. And uh, it also invites different scales of, uh, and routes of finance and investment. So... Um, uh, 
do you know obviously they're smaller scales or they're they're cheaper to buy different actors can can buy them or uh, local authorities uh, uh, it, can can invest in them but also we we see um, uh, things like solar leasing schemes emerge uh, different patterns of, of own ownership there and uh, finally the distributed energy has different scales and dynamics of energy distribution uh, from uh, national transmission networks to uh, more regional and local energy distribution networks. Uh, also the dynamics of the electricity distribution, instead of just being a simple one way from the center to the periphery, can become two way. I'll describe that in more detail when I come on to um, uh, smart grids. But just a bit of the political economy um, uh, around um, goodness me, a bit of the political economy around distributed energy. So a lot of this really comes from uh, uh, the German pioneers of uh, feed-in tariffs, really the idea of an energy transition from below. So um, unlike previous energy transitions with big, expensive, centralized plant, this energy transition uh, can be brought about in part as a co uh, mass consumer item revolution. Really in a similar way to Fordism emerged in the mid 20th century, everybody being you know, increasingly able to buy their own individual car, which revolutionized the economy. Now everyone can buy their own uh, power station, their own uh, solar panels, and it, it emerges as a mass consumer project. Uh, but of course this, this emerges um, uh, also with state support, with the feed-in tariffs to encourage that. Now, of course, this has raised certain questions about equality. You know, uh, if it's up to individual consumers to buy the new solar panels, then um, uh, not everyone can afford solar panels. So it distributes the new power plant maybe away from corporate monopolies, but might distribute it more amongst the middle class. But, you know, this is characteristic of the energy transition from below. And then when we look at how various actors um, visualize um, the energy transition, their various scenarios, looking at there's a, a UK coalition of academics called the Realizing Transitions Pathway um, Consortium. And they characterize three kind of um, governance logics of energy transition. The first being the state, uh, centralized state. The second being markets and the third being civil society. And this civil society transition pathway, they call the thousand flowers pathway. You know, let a thousand flowers blossom. You know, rather than it being centralized, it just comes from below. Now, how this is governed, whether the thousand flowers has a gardener, whether it's a jungle or a neat little garden, we don't know. But, you know, going back to the, the um, slogan I... You know, uh, to remind you, from the big six to the big 60 million, you know, this big 60 million, you know, the 60 million flowers, this diverse plurality emerging from below. Um, so, uh, you know, th this is a not yet the hegemonic uh, energy transition pathway or discourse. Centralised generation scenarios remain hegemonic in Britain. You know, looking at George Osborne's love for Hinkley Point, the new nuclear build, you know, the distributed energy isn't the dominant paradigm yet, but uh, it's articulated by a whole range of major players, from governments to industry to research. So this is the CEO of the National Grid, the National Grid company, which operates in both North America and the UK. I mean, it's a huge company. So, you know, he's saying the world is clearly moving towards much more distributed energy production and towards microgrids. The pace of that development is uncertain. That depends on political decisions, regulatory incentive, etc. But the direction is clear. And it's interesting, you know, the way he talks about the pace of development being uncertain. You know, he's his, his commenting in, a, in the same article I got this quotation from about the UK government's announcements this summer, you know, uh, which some say will kill off the UK renewable energy industry, you know, the early end of feed-in tariffs, changes to planning regulations, etc. 
but uh, Steve Holiday is it's going to slow it down. But this is still something that's happening across across the world. Um, and just to, you know how people visualize it. This is uh, um, from General Electric, you know, and they this is their historical kind of overview. You know, the late. 19th, early 20th century, you still have distributed power, municipalities, a whole random collection of small-scale distribution systems. The mid-20th century, what political economists sometimes call Fordism or organized capitalism. You have central, uh, centralized generation. And now in the 21st century, the integrated energy systems era. And, you know, I'm interested in how these are represented. So, like, this networky thing with the bubbles and the lines, you know, what exactly does this represent? And, you notice some nodes are bigger than others. You know, they're not all equal nodes. I'll leave you with that thought for a bit. So, on to smart grids. Um, uh, I want to call them smart utopias as well. You know, there's this whole discourse of smart that all our social and technological problems can be solved with the magic wand of smartness. You know, a discourse that's really gained traction in the 70s after limits of growth that somehow information is infinite and can, oh, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's there in uh, Daniel Bell's uh, The Information Society in the 70s that somehow information technology will help us overcome the contradictions of a finite planet. But with smart grids, information technology regulates the new energy dynamics. You know, the new dynamics of renewable energy, variable, intermittent generation, depending on the weather, the clouds, the wind, uh, and the rhythms of daily life, the peaks and troughs of energy demand to do with when people get up, when they go to work. Somehow, the, 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 you know, the problem of uh, matching supply and demand with renewable energy will be ironed out, will be balanced out through smartness, through the convergence of information technology with energy systems. Uh, this can be done through demand response. So you have a smart meter uh, and uh, price signals. So it's a kind of market uh, structure of price signals, but a kind of cyber governance structure as well. So when the energy is cheap, oh, it's sunny. There's plenty of solar power in the grid at the moment because, of course, electricity can't be stored or not yet. Um, so it'll turn on your washing machine now because it's sunny, you know. And so somehow it will regulate uh, what your appliances do and coordinate with them with the weather. And, you know, it's in a way quite a hubristic vision that somehow we will have this cybernetic system where the weather, people's daily life rhythms, everything else will become coordinated. Uh, another uh, new feature of this, of course, is the uh, with you, you're not just a consumer if you have your own solar panels, you're also an energy producer, what uh, people are starting to call the prosumer, the portmanteau word of both. Uh, and uh, therefore, the energy system, the, the distribution network, will have to manage two-way flows. It becomes bi-directional, a totally different scenario. And again, another aspect of this is new scales of distribution and a discourse of energy localization. Uh, this comes in with a whole series of registers of legitimating a local wind farm by uh, um, allowing people nearby the wind farm to have cheaper electricity from that rather than feeding it onto a national grid. So some, you know, there's uh, at the moment electricity on the national grid uh, is balanced through some kind of unit of information and commerce called a national balancing unit. But they're developing... Uh, on the horizon, this idea of local balancing units. So energy can be localized. Uh, German villages are already talking about local energy. But again, I want to talk about the kind of distributional and social justice aspects of this, of when energy is localized, who's included, who's excluded. Um, finally, uh, just to bear in mind when we're thinking about smart grids that and, and energy democracy, that it's not only just how we govern the energy system, but how the energy system governs us, how it's biopolitical, you know, this network of uh, devices and smart meters to alter our behavior. Um, uh, you know, you can read it through uh, Foucauldian spectacles.
Okay, good. So this is uh, the Max Planck uh, Society, um, uh, how they visualize it. You know, I, I, I think it's very pretty. You know, and, and, and again, you can see, I don't know if anyone's read Deleuze and Guattari's uh, Thousand Plateau, but, you know, this, is, this seems to suggest the move from the arboreal, the tree-like, the trunk, the centralized, unidirectional, unilinear, to something more rhizomatic and networked. Now, that's an old-fashioned point when it comes to network society. Every sociologist drones on and on about this rhizomatic network structure. But this is also what can happen to the energy system and the kind of social relations that might uh, be co-produced along with it. Um, so the next feature that this uh, energy democracy might emerge within is uh, market liberalization, which followed privatization. Privatization moved it from a state monopoly, a state capitalist monopoly, to private capitalist monopolies. This uh, market liberalization tries to um, demonopolize through first allowing new entrants to the electricity market to be able to sell their electricity to the network. And secondly, these are shifts that happened in the 90s and the beginning of this century. The other shift is allowing consumers to switch between different suppliers to, to create more market competition, which in some versions is, is more democratic. Uh, I'll, I'll go into more detail of this later. The Ofgem, the uh, regulator in the UK, have had a been talking about new entrants into the market and non-traditional business models. This is also featuring the Competition and Markets Authority uh, investigation this year. So, you know, um, the paradox really is, is that a lot of uh, energy democracy discourses talk about the re-socialization and the deprivatization of energy. And yet a lot of these new social community and municipal players, the only way they can enter the energy system is through market liberalization. Uh, so, you know, is market liberalization a route to energy democracy, but also how does this liberal market shape what democracy might mean and the different imaginaries of democracy? Um, good. Right, so here we are on energy democracy. And I'm going to try and take a look at the different, I'm going to give a few examples of energy democracy <coughs> movements and discourses and place them along a kind of spectrum. Uh, uh, and the kind of ideas I'm playing with to analyze these different discourses are uh, looking first at uh, representative versus participatory democracy. Um, uh, Representative democracy tends to be associated with um, institutions on the national scale, uh, but I'm going to describe it. Uh, representative democracy, uh, representative energy democracy, is you know fairly conventional. Um, we elect the government. The government somehow regulates the energy system, you know, and that's a very weak form of energy democracy. Uh, quite far removed. Um, but again, it had two phases. One, the nationalized period following the war, and then uh, in the last quarter of the 20th century, the privatized period, perhaps an even weaker <coughs> form of uh, en energy democracy. Um, uh, and the, the participatory democracy, which tends to e envisage operation on a much more local scale, um, uh, but again, it can have different, uh, there can be different versions of participatory democracy. There can be a neoliberal, marketized version of uh, participatory democracy and a neo social democratic one. Um, but, you know, participatory democracy really um, uh, emerges from a critique of the limits of representative democracy. The common features really is a desire to be present rather than simply represented. Uh, it's against uh, distant centers of power and wants power to be more localized. Um, the, it uh, valorizes being self-governing and autonomous. Uh, it emphasizes everyday life and decisions in your everyday life. Um, so the um, 
location of uh, participatory democracy is often envisaged as the workplace, the community, or a local energy system or a local renewable energy product. Um, uh, it also relates to the idea of, you know, the uh, politics isn't simply uh, a sphere that should be separate from economics, but somehow democracy should govern everyday economic life as well, the things that affect people every day. Another aspect I want to bring in really comes from Bruno Latour's idea that democracy is object-oriented, that people, that publics, that communities are... Uh, a formed come into being around objects, around material structures, around infrastructures and infrastructural commons. So um, uh, how, how a, you know, a kind of actor network take on it, how um, a democratic community might emerge around a particular energy product. Uh, again, it emphasizes localism, small is beautiful, decentered networks, and this participatory democracy, there can be communitarian versions, uh, which kind of blur into um, versions more compatible with a neoliberal big society localism characteristic of the Cameron government. There's, so again, a, a feature of this is blurred lines, hybridity, and you can really come up with various, from this, various versions of energy democracy, libertarian ones, you know, which are kind of off grid. You know, you look at a lot of the Tea Party in the States, you know, they kind of view the national grid as some version of socialism. And if they've got their own uh, off grid version, they're, you know, the kind of survivalist mentality. There's liberal ones of a kind of Lockean property owning democracy that if we all own our own solar panels, that's some sort of uh, democracy. There's communitarian versions coming around our, our energy co ops and communes and uh, communities, mutualist, uh, uh, oh, anyway, I'll go into it peer to peer. Uh, collectivist and finally socialist ones, although more a kind of a what we see at the moment is more a discourse akin to municipal socialism, a kind of gradualist, Fabian, pragmatic socialism of the municipality. Um, so, without further ado, um, this is the uh, I'm going to try and here explore the affinity between uh, nationally organized representative democracy, uh, energy democracy, and the national grid. And really a kind of historical schema. 1921, there were 480 local energy suppliers in the UK, both municipally and privately owned. Um, uh, a, a real bricolage of uh, different uh, forms and scales of, of local energy. Different vo voltages and frequencies. Very laissez-faire uh, energy system. And that problem, because it wasn't standardised. So in 1926, I mean, and again, Britain was lagging behind France and Germany, which had a centralised energy structure by then, but Britain much more laissez-faire. 1926, the year of the general strike in Britain. Crisis was really intense. And this is, in, the, in a way, the first Keynesian organised capitalist project of a new phase of capitalism beyond laissez-faire, um, uh, a more dirigist, uh, 20th century uh, state-controlled capitalism really emerges around the national grid. It's a project which makes Britain, you know, it's a kind of nation-forming project in a way. Uh, and, you know, again, it was objected to when they built the national grid. People thought it was a version of socialism. It reminded them of Stalinist Russia, you know, where Lenin, I mean, before Stalinist Russia, when Lenin said socialism equals Soviets plus electrification. You know, so this suddenly Britain, to try and dig itself out of the economic crisis, was having this dirigist new form of uh, energy infrastructure, again characterised by increased size of power stations and increased distance between generation and use. The national grid. This picture is the first national grid in 1933. So, um, again, and it, it, if, if we look at kind of uh, energy as a kind of imaginary, 
ripping off Benedict Anderson, you know, imagined communities and merging it with a talk of socio-technical imaginaries. Here we've got an imagined energy demos of the nation, an imagined national community. Uh, and it emerges really uh, with an affinity with Fordism, Keynesianism, welfare state, egalitarianism. Um, uh, with, with a, a kind of envisaged um, energy democracy, it's centralised and nationalised. It's a national public good on a national scale. It's universal, standardised and abundant. Everyone gets the same service at the same price. Um, it, the national grid expanded uses, generated so social change. But in the 1970s, that whole Fordist regime of accumulation goes into crisis. The oil crisis of 1974 becomes the big marker of this. And, and it can be seen as a revolt against organised capitalism, social democracy. And it comes from two directions. There's the new left with its critique of bureaucratic standardization and conformity, you know, the new left with its tropes of participatory democracy, uh, and the, the, the new left uh, if, with its critique of bureaucratic standardization and the paternalistic welfare state, its, its proposed solution was radical democratization. And the new right, with a pretty similar critique of bureaucratic standardization, proposed privatization as its radical solution. But we can see how these two different solutions interact. It's also very interesting to note, really, that if the 1974 crisis marks the end of the Fordist regime of capital accumulation, the emergence of the neoliberal regime of capital accumulation, that crisis of Fordism was also really the birth of modern environmentalism in the late 60s, early 70s, the publication of Limits to Growth. So in a way, neoliberalism and environmentalism were born as kind of conjoined twins, both wrestling with each other, but also interacting and feeding off each other. Um, so, uh, neoliberal energy democracy. Uh, uh, bum, uh, which is, uh, let's just go back. Um, so the, the, the problem of monopoly, which survived privatization, the proposed solution is more market liberalization, more competition, et cetera, et cetera. This is Greg Barker, who former uh, Tory um, Minister of State for Energy and Climate Change, move over big six, we need the big 60,000. Uh, choice, competition and a dynamic market are all recipes for success. And he wrote a manifesto in 2006, Power to the People, an age of popular, decentralised community energy. Um, again, this uh, big six discourse, move over big six, we need the big 60,000. It's also there in Jeremy Corbyn's, you know, the new left-wing leader of the Labour Party. He uses exactly the same phase in his energy manifesto, Big six to the big 60,000. Uh, again, a plurality of places saying we're not going to return to state, centralised state nationalisation, but social ownership in, you know, a plurality of forms. This discourse emerges on the left and the right. And I'm going to try and talk about important divergences, but also important convergences. I was going to put a picture of this gentleman holding a, uh, a little porcine animal, but I thought that would be cruel. Um, so this is, okay, um, this is uh, Call Me Dave, Dave Cameron. This is the uh, speech he did in 2007. Uh, Power to the people, the decentralized energy revolution. Uh, the bureaucratic age is over. Uh, the information revolution and advances in technology mean that the politics of the bureaucratic age is, uh, is ended. We can put real power in people's hands. That's what decentralized energy is all about. It's energy for the post-bureaucratic age. So, you know, this, uh, this is no, you know, not just a left-wing phenomena. Um, you know, it's on, on left, left and right. You can find these statements from all sorts of business gurus, big players in industry. Um, so this is from the uh, 
Ofgem, the UK regulator, they had a consultation this year on non-traditional business models supporting transformative change in the energy market. So it's this discourse of disruptive innovation. Okay, so here they're looking at the new entrants into the energy market. Uh, community uh, energy organisations, community energy projects, municipal energy product uh, projects, you know, the re they talk about uh, remunicipalization, local authorities running their own energy supply companies, uh, housing associations, um, uh, the, the bundled services in the middle, the most interesting part there is the move from energy as a bulk commodity supplied as a universal standard uh, to energy as a service. So an energy company will just sell you a warm room rather than units of metered electricity. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll sell you the warm room by providing insulation, perhaps. So it's a, a move, again, away from a Fordist bulk commodity to flexible markets, specialised markets. And again, most interestingly, in the blue box on the right is a whole form of new social forms. If there's this new energy landscape of small producers, then there's all sorts of new forms of association which can emerge between them. They're looking at peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, energy exchanges between individual owners of solar grids or wind farms and individual consumers, virtual power stations where uh, maybe a, a neighbourhood of, of solar panel owners can become a virtual power station through magic of software. Uh, or, uh, okay, so... Uh, communities of energy. Uh, the, the first one, this is the more communitarian um, version of uh, energy democracy. Um, uh, again, again, it raises questions, what is a community? Uh, is a local authority a community or is a community just a, a more localised? Is it just an uh, aggregation of private individuals or does it involve public bodies? Uh, communities and energy systems are co-constructed together. Uh, uh, anyway, as soon as I'm running out of time, I'll move. I'll just quickly skip beyond this slide. But a few salient points to flag up is that uh, communities aren't homogenous and they can contain inequalities. So we should be alert that community energy isn't necessarily egalitarian. This is West Mill, a very you know right-on project by some very progressive uh, activists who have set it up. Um, and uh, they've got, you know, uh, hundreds or perhaps thousands of uh, investors, small shareholders who have bought into the solar and wind co-op within a five mile radius. And yet not everyone, of course, in the area can afford to buy shares. A lot of community energy try and sell shares at less than 10 pounds and distribute ownership very widely. But it's still, you know, it's a particular model of uh, ownership and communitarian ownership. Um, this is uh, um, uh, Julia Davenport of Good Energy, which is one of the new commercial entrants into the energy market. Um, again, I, I, I just selected those quote, quotations, really. Uh, this is a, a slightly different version of energy democracy. Um, but again, it, it has a vision of uh, energy democracy supports thousands of individual independent generators, a decentralized and democratic network. So democracy, therefore, is the end of monopoly and the distribution of ownership amongst thousands of people. But it doesn't necessarily have to be public ownership. It can be ownership by the public as a collection of private individuals. And again, okay, uh, the small is beautiful trope uh, again, in, in, the, in the little bubble. So this is a more militant and explicitly socialist imaginary of energy democracy from the states-based or it's a global coalition, trade unions for energy democracy, truly just transition for workers, require reasserting public good over private greed, uh, equitable uh, energy system can only occur decisive shift towards workers, communities and the public, democratic direction, public intervention, community control, and then most explicitly, a transfer of resources, capital and infrastructure from private hands to a democratically controlled public sector. So uh, this is the most explicitly socialist uh, view version of energy democracy, and it rather than being an aggregation of private individuals forming the public, it's collectives 
uh, forming public, public ownership. Uh, and this kind of crops up most within uh, the energy municipalization discourse. Um, it, it, it's really, the, the, whenever you look at uh, examples of energy municipalization in the UK, which is what this slide's all about, most of them refer to the German energy vendor and the municipalization happening there. So like in Hamburg, where they bought back the energy distribution network the city council has with the Unser Netz campaign. In Berlin, you know, where they tried to have a referendum, you know, the, to buy back the city energy supply. But it's a version of uh, the collective demos of uh, the public engages with the energy system as a collective. So they campaign as a collective to demand a referendum as a social movement. If they then win the referendum and the city buys back the energy supply, you relate to the energy system as a voter, as a citizen, rather than as a private individual or a consumer. Um, uh, in the UK, there's a whole series of moves. So this is a quotation from the Association of Public Sector Excellence who have set up the energy uh, collaboration of local authorities. And again, they talk about the municipalization of energy services, by which we mean public and community, as well as private ownership, control uh, of local energy. Um, so it's a hybrid version. It's public, community, and private. Um, again, other examples, uh, Kate Henderson, the Town and Country Planning Association, talking about councils buying back control of the energy grid. That's still a long way away. What's happening in the UK is local government are becoming energy suppliers by entering into the energy market. So I've been interviewing uh, people from various new municipal energy companies this summer. So this summer, Bristol City Council set up Bristol Energy, a wholly owned energy supply company owned by the local government. Uh, Nottingham have done the same. They're calling it Robin Hood Energy uh, after the local uh, troublemaker who stole from the rich to give from the poor. And these, they, they, they emphasize um, local identity. They think they're more trustworthy uh, operators than the privatized utilities. Um, and, but they hope to win over customer base through that trustworthiness, through a kind of market-led municipalization. Another example I've been interviewing is Ovo Energy, which is another private uh, company entering the new energy market, but it partners with local authorities. So it's partnering with uh, Plymouth Council in the UK, Cheshire Council, loads of other councils where it's a kind of public-private partnership. The council wins over the trust and the uh, OVO Energy, I don't know what they do, make the money, do the backroom stuff. Anyway, there's all sorts of interesting things going on there. That's energy municipalization. So finally, my conclusion, which I'll try and take like three minutes, oh, two minutes, okay, one minute, okay. So to crudely arrange these discourses on a kind of left-right spectrum, between a kind of homo economicus of the individual uh, consumer mode, the market mode of energy governance, and the more political, collective, deliberative, and democratic mode of the zoon politicon. So on the right-hand side, you know, the example of the, which I gave from Berlin, of the collective citizen of the demos. So how do you relate to your energy system? If you don't like what it's doing, you vote for a different city council. It becomes a political question. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is a Tea Party symbol of an uh, uh, individual um, uh, off-grid libertarian solar owners resisting corporate control. Power to the people, that's the Tory decentralized energy manifesto. And in the middle are these kind of hybrid public-private partnerships and also public-public partnerships, which can be a partnership between a local authority and an energy co-op. All sorts of interesting formations. Piclo is a new peer-to-peer -peer, uh, energy, energy network. Um, but to really look at these different modes of engagement of, of the public within the energy system are uh, 
on the one on the on the homo economicus side really this is the 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 public of the smart grid and the liberalized energy market if you don't like your energy supply you switch you switch to a new supplier and the idea that uh uh, more competition and more switching mobile consumers will democratize the energy system somehow and lead it also to be more <laughs> low carbon. But I, I kind of want to characterize this, maybe ask the question, is this the smart idiot? You know, going from Aristotle's uh, description of the idiot, the idioten, the private individual who doesn't take part in the demos, the, the democratic life. And so this combination of the very privatized, governed person through their smart meter, who, you know, the active consumer, but not the active political subject, and at the other side, the, 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 the energy democracy, which kind of uh, talks about bringing into being uh, the collective subject to govern the energy system. So partly it's a question of distributional justice, but also procedural justice, but also who do we become? What kind of subjectivity, what kind of subjects will we become through these new energy systems? So uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. That was uh, fantastic. Sorry to have to push you on a bit at the end. Have you got that there? Yeah. Great. So, uh, questions. I, I, was just, I was just noting that up to now the questions have tended to be dominated by the speakers. So you're getting, you're getting a lot of the sort of speakers plus their questions. So I would absolutely encourage other people in, in the room to, to ask questions as well. And an, in, an instant response. Rachel at the back. Yeah, thank you very much for this great uh, storytelling and your enthusiasm. Um, I just have one question about um, energy democracy. Do you think it's more inclusive and to what extent uh, does it take into consideration uh, vulnerable consumers who are usually more or less excluded from the centralized system? Um, yeah, energy democracy can be more inclusive. I mean, but it all, you know, the. As I say, it depends on the form of energy democracy. So um, an energy co-op or maybe a community energy product could be quite exclusive if you haven't bought into it, if you haven't bought shares in it. You could live in the locality but feel excluded through poverty. Some uh, community energy products try and address that um, by targeting, you know, by uh, low-income areas, by trying to build solar projects in deprived areas, uh, often working with uh, social housing associations to try and be more inclusive. But so, you know, there, there are liberal and communitarian versions of energy democracy which can be exclusive. The idea of a municipal energy democracy, of course, if you're in the territory of the local authority, then you're a subject to it. You know, you're, 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 you're an elector you know, of, of that uh, municipality. Um, so it's potentially more, you know, more, more inclusive. Um, of course, the, the centralized system is exclusive in the sense that there's very little democratic control over it. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. I would like your opinion on the um, vulnerable consumers. I mean, uh, what right. does that change for them? Well, so um, some municipal, uh, municipal energy companies in Bristol and Nottingham, you know, explicitly state in their mission that they uh, will, will try and address the problem of fuel poverty in their areas with, um, uh, so they think they could find better tariffs for the fuel poor in an, in an area, and they also talk about end, uh, ending prepayment meters and things like that. So, you know, they do talk about uh, fuel poverty. Um, but again, uh, some other versions of energy democracy, the more liberal version, the kind of property owning democracy of uh, individual householders owning their solar panels, obviously that can exclude those who can't afford a solar panel. Okay, uh, the question from John here at the front. 
Oh, hang on, hang on. Okay. No, it's, this is, it's all really interesting and it's I was informative. Can I just ask you some just straightforward information? Most of what you've been talking about is energy distribution to households, but not to productive units. And, produ and production has much higher energy uh, consumption than individual households do. So I just wonder how this fits in to the general, you know, productive consumption, so to speak, rather than final consumption. Yes, so um, the, thanks for that, yeah. Uh, so it features a lot in a lot of uh, discourses around uh, distributed energy that uh, businesses might have their own supply, you know, and uh, often, you know, the, the distributed energy that occurs at the moment is where uh, a, a business or a factory has its own plant and its own private wire. I mean, I think this was the case at Lancaster University, wasn't it? It had its own generating plant, which, uh, you know, su supplies the university. Um, uh, but again, you know, the whole question of, uh, you know, big energy-intensive industry and how that can be... Uh, yeah, that, that's... Uh, and, and again, you know, the, the, a lot of visions of di uh, distributed energy, they don't rule out any centralised... You know, they, so, some visions talk about a combination of centralised and decentralised. And really... Uh, decentralization and decentralization aren't necessarily opposite poles. That decentralization can only happen within the context of something else being centralized. Yeah. Do you see any implication um, of this for, for climate change and greenhouse gas emissions? Well, I mean, the rationale for renewable distributed energy is that it's low carbon so uh, as I said uh, when I began the talk you know the people justify democratizing the energy system because they believe that will accelerate its transition to low carbon sources well, you, also noted that, you also noted that um, fossil fuel generation is moving or can move to yeah. a smaller scale as well. And so the question is what kind of um, decisions might different organizations make? Yeah. So um, in the UK, the low carbon source favored by the government is uh, shale gas fracking, you know, uh, which isn't that low carbon, you know, um, uh, or low greenhouse gas. Um, Again, a lot of uh, local authorities, their versions of distributed energy involve combined heat and power plants. So, again, these use fossil fuels, but they don't waste the heat. You know, the heat, you know, what combined heat and power is where the heat from the generation of the electricity is fed directly into a dis uh, district through uh, maybe hot water pipes beneath the ground. So, um, uh, but it, therefore it produces carbon emissions. It's a fossil fuel burning thing, but it's much more efficient and low carbon than centralized generation. Um, other visions, other, you know, so a lot of uh, other local authorities are very much dependent upon biogas or landfill gas. And of course that's not greenhouse gas free, but it's uh, using waste products. Um, so you, you, you can even have uh, fossil fuels incorporated into distributed energy, but it still emits less uh, carbon, carbon dioxide than centralized generation, where the heat is just wasted through cooling towers. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, distributed energy isn't dependent upon renewable energy. They, they overlap, but they're not the same thing. But probably the you know renewable energy is by and large distributed energy, although of course with large offshore wind farms, that can also be centralised. There's even talk of small-scale modular nuclear reactors um, currently in the UK, which could be distributed as well. I can't remember who else. Uh, Jeremy, and then. Oh, thanks very much, Larry. Um, w when I was at school, we had to study uh, the Australian gold rushes in the 1850s, right? And 
the only thing I remember from that is that if you want to get rich in a gold rush, you, you don't go looking for gold. What you, you do shovels. is you, you sell shovels. And um, uh, isn't there kind of a parallel here in that um, uh, lots of the distributed energy, well, as far as I know, all of the distributed energy systems are, are you know, sold by very large and increasingly larger private companies. Um, so, so even though uh, the distribution of the sources of uh, energy production might be um, more de de democratic, uh, yes. the infrastructure itself is, is still very much in the big companies' hands. So, so how, how does that fact, you, that might be a little unfair to, to your analysis, but how does that kind of fact al alter what you want to say? Thank about you for that point. I actually... Uh, was having this real feeling of horror because I was going to make that very point on around slide two. And as, as I was just ticking through my brain of important points I missed, so that's marvellous. It's almost telepathy that, uh, that you've said that. Um, and it's true. So uh, with the, the produce of so, producers of so, solar panels have become more and more centralised. Um, so especially so the feed-in tariff that you know when when germany developed the feed-in tariff policy uh you know it wanted to generate this uh energy transition from below by small petty owners and producers but it also wanted to uh, support a new industry in germany of solar panel manufacture but within a globalized liberal market the most of the german solar uh, panel manufacturers have failed and solar panel manufacturing has been centralized in China and we're seeing increased monopoly over that aspect of the market so exactly you're, there's a dialectic of centralization and decentralization while there's decentralization in one aspect of the system in terms of ownership of generation capacity there's centralization of production there can also be centralizations of ownership so with uh, solar leasing, you know, where so a lot of people who can't afford to buy uh, their own panels and invest over £20,000 in their own rooftop solar, uh, a company will come and lease your roof and lease you the solar panels. You get the free electricity or the reduced rate electricity, but you don't get to own it. But again, that can lead to new concentrations of monopoly power within the system. So there's, you know, it swings and roundabouts, you know, and exactly, I don't think that this is uh, some utopia. It's, you know, the, the, I think one of the points of my, of this talk is to show, is to make us wary of these very nice sounding discourses of democratization and pointing to the market context within which they occur. And there's all sorts of, you know, there's other centralizations and decentralizations going on all the time. So... The move to district heating in the UK, there, you know, a lot of Paris and Berlin has centralised district heating. You know, you live in a, a block and the whole block is heated. In Britain, they ripped out all these district heating things after the war and in, everybody has their own little gas um, uh, central heating, you know, their own little gas boiler in their house. You know, that's very decentralised and very inefficient. And so, like Manchester are talking about bringing back district heating where a housing area will have one boiler, like a combined heat and power plant, and a big radiator system around the whole housing area. So dis that's distributed energy, but it's more centralised than the current gas system. So, but again, I think, you know, rather than looking at decentralization as the polar opposite of centralization, they often happen in dialectical unity. Thanks. This is, this is really interesting, and I had no idea about the, the variety of distributed, uh, various forms of the provision of distributive energy. Um, and I, I guess this counts more as musings than either a comment or a a question, but I mean, what one thought is there may be need for another axis. I mean, one axis may be uh, democracy versus market. Another axis might have to do with ownership, whether it's a, a collective version of ownership or a private version of ownership. But that doesn't ne that doesn't neatly map on to whether decisions are made democratically or whether they're made by the market. Um, and it might be interesting to categorize things that way. Um, I, I'm, 
and maybe here's an, another bit of the musing. I mean, it, it just strikes me that it's an interesting question of, for political theory when it comes to complex modern societies, to what extent they should be organized on the basis of trying to trying to seek uh, a, the, uh, a policy that is the result of a, of, a, of a majority vote where unity is important and a policy um, that's a result of something like a, a, a market uh, in which unity isn't that important. And that's not always a left-right sort of issue, right? I mean, you think about the Austro-Marxists. The Austro-Marxists thought that the, the national question should be handled by something like a market. And it made a certain amount of sense. If you were to have vote on, on, on what nationality would be in place, then you would have, then the, the rights of a lot of minorities in that case would have been infringed on. So um, it's interesting to, I, I think it's interesting to think about what sorts of circumstances or what, for what sorts of issues markets seem to do, be, do, be the right sort of institutional framework and in what sorts of um, circumstances or for what sorts of concerns democracy seems to be the right sorts of, uh, right, right sort of, uh, of, of way to handle the, 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 the need for coming to a collective decision. And I honestly don't have a clue with respect to energy which, which camp it falls in. Yes, thank you for that. That's, uh, I hadn't really thought about uh, Otto Bohr and the Austro-Marxists and their solution to the, natural, uh, the national question, which was pluralistic and, and market based and so yeah that reminds me some things might be market systems uh, might be more appropriate for certain forms of decision making or uh, social processes and perhaps as long as they're not the overarching social process but subordinate to more democratic social processes that might work um, but I think that's a, an excellent point you make really and it's about the contrast between the political and the post-political. Um, so the smart grid liberalized market is a kind of form of uh, post-political energy governance, which could be appropriate for certain things, but it, let's talk about where it's inappropriate. So when we talk about post-political environmental governance, you know, say, look at my previous area of research around uh, GM crops and agricultural biotechnology. You know, the EU tried to govern this environmental controversy through segregated markets, through GM and non-GM uh, products. So if you didn't like the agro-industrial system around GM food, you could choose to buy organic, GM-free. If you like if, on the other hand, you, you know, so it, it, it turns a, a, you know, a political question into an individual question of consumer choice, and it depoliticizes the question. And it, 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 but it also seems a, a bit absurd because the eco-agricultural system is a collective. You know, there's, a, there's, there's one, you know, it, uh, the same with, uh, you know, the climate. So... Um, I saw one, one system where um, someone had tried to devise a low-carbon product, so you would have a low-carbon label, and you would buy only low-carbon things, but if you weren't that bothered about climate change, you wouldn't buy low-carbon things. And so the market gives us this choice. But of course then, you know, when uh, dramatic climate change really kicks in and the methane's melting in the Siberia and everything's going horrendous, you can't take your receipts and say to the Lord or the cosmos, here are my low carbon receipts from all my purchases, please exempt me from this collective hell. You know, this post-political individualized market governance seems absurd when it comes and, but, but this is also why people favour it. You know, if, if uh, the transition to a low-carbon uh, socio-technical infrastructure and economy is seen as controversial, a lot of people seem to imagine we can bypass politics through technological innovation and markets. Uh, and that, that can be an illegitimate short-circuiting of the political process but in other situations, that can be really useful, like the Austro-Marxists perhaps really wanting to short-circuit the political process, because if nationality and ethnicity become politicised in the Balkans, you get, you know, genocides and things like that. So it might be sometimes appropriate to diffuse a political situation 
through that pluralistic thing. But maybe when we're making collective choices about greenhouse gas emissions and future energy systems, this post-political individualized mode of governance is exactly what we want to avoid. I was just building up to ask my own question using Chair's prerogative, but I'm actually going to use Chair's prerogative to say it's now time for lunch because we've delayed it by 15 minutes and we should push on. So um, thank you ever so much, Larry. There was, there was an enormous amount in that presentation that um, I'm sure we can get value from discussing in other fora. So thank you very much. Cheers.